with us getting closer and closer every single day. It's done playing church. It's done pretending. It's done just showing up. It's done. We need God here. We need God now. We need God for our friends. We need God for our family members. We need God for this culture. We need God for salvation. We need God for his
everything has to stay out. We enter into your presence, Lord. We praise you, we praise you, we praise you, Lord. I don't want to be a washer, watcher. I want to be a worshiper. I want to be a watcher. 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 I
to be a worshiper. It's all for you, it's all for you, it's all for you, it's all for you. I don't want to be a watcher, I want to be a worshiper. I don't want to be a watcher, I want to be a worshiper. Lord, it's all for you, it's all for you, it's all for you, it's all for you. Oh, Lord. Lift up your hands, minister of God. Ministers of God, lift up your hand, lift up your hand. God's going to refresh you. God, I'm, clean, I'm including myself right now. I need to be refreshed. Refresh your ministers tonight, Jesus. Refresh your ministers tonight, Jesus. Refresh your ministers tonight, Jesus. Fresh manna, fresh manna. You are speaking on the earth, God. Give us fresh manna. Destroy, destroy, destroy who we think we are, what people say we are, and what we know we are. Fresh, 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 fresh manna. Fresh messages for today, for today, for today. We don't want to preach what someone else said. We want to preach what you are telling us today, God. Refresh. Refresh. We need your glory right now, God. We need your presence, God. Are tired. We get annoyed if we're truthful. We get annoyed at times, God. We minister out of empty tanks, God. We become, we come because we have to be an example, God, but we want to come again to meet with you, Jesus. Refresh your ministers, God. That we can minister to you first and then others. Oh God, we need you. We're messed up, God. We need you. We don't know what to do. We need you. thought you think it's going to be and what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. I see the hand of God with a big old eraser erasing it all up. You don't know what you're going to do. You don't even know what you're going to say, but God is already there for you. You pray. You ask God for fresh manna every day. Thank you. 
and doing things in order. But listen, you're here. You're brand new. Maybe you came for the first time. Or you've been here a long time, but you feel the need right now. You ministers stay where you're at. You feel the need to rededicate your life, to recommit your life to Jesus. You can be a mother, a father, a grandma, a teenager. Come, come quickly up here right now. Come. Come, come. You might be serving. Get out of your seat and come right here. Meet me right here. You want to give your life back to Jesus. I feel there's a pulling, even for some of you that have been here a while. Come close. Come close. Identify yourself. You can be a cure group leader. You, I don't care who you are. It's better to get right with Jesus tonight than wait for tomorrow. Come. 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 There's a few mothers here that you're feeling the presence of God. And you're like, man, I should go, but I don't know. Just get out of your seat. I recommit my values to the cross. I recommit my convictions back to the cross. See, getting saved is just recommitting to the truth. You're recommitting to the truth, not your truth, God's truth. Identify yourself. Lift your hand up. You're, you're coming to, to rededicate, to give your life to Jesus. Lift your hand. Lift your hand. Identify yourself. I thank you for these honest men and women, Lord God. They recommit their life to you, Jesus. Help them to walk according to your word, not according to their emotion or their feelings. To the truth. The truth does not always feel right or good. We hate truth. If we can all be honest tonight, we hate truth sometimes because we don't get to get what we want. But God says truth is is your freedom tonight truth my truth is your freedom it's your liberty we thank you god we thank you god we thank you god we thank you god we can sing that song again one more time through the trial through the trial through the storm i will lift you up through the trial Corinthians chapter 3 it says that where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom you want freedom run to where his spirit is at you want breakthrough in your finances you want your marriage to be healed you want to stop sinning run to his spirit find where his spirit run to it and stay there Father, I thank you right now, Father, for every soul in this house who's seeking you, Father. Lord, I pray tonight, God, that there would be something new, Father, that there would be something fresh to take home to, God. I bind the lies of the enemy. I bind the mind battles. Father, have your way tonight. Use Pastor Lewis in a mighty way. In a mighty way, use them more than you have ever used them in his life. Use them tonight to bring the gospel 
Father, I love you. And I just thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Man, that was awesome. Thank you, Pastor Esther, for that, that refreshing anointing. That was awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Um, welcome, everyone, to Sunday night. Um, I noticed we have some new merch out there. It looks amazing. Cool stuff. But I was, I was looking at the merch, and I was thinking, man, we're all going to put it on, but we need to live it. Are we the, is Jesus the cure? Are we going to encounter the Holy Spirit? We need to live in his presence. We need to live in his presence. So don't just physically put it on. Be that. If he's done anything for you through the trials, through the storms, if he was the cure, be the cure for somebody else. Make that statement wherever you go. Let that be a statement. And um, tonight's going to be awesome. As he said, Pastor Lewis from Lee Summit, Cure is here. So it's going to be awesome. We're going to put 60 seconds on the clock. Turn around and meet and greet someone. tithe and offering tonight when I open uh, the book of Luke chapter 16 it's verse 10 11 10 and 11 the one who is faithful and what is least is also faithful in what is much to me being faithful is when you think you have every reason not to be a blessing but you trust God and you give anyway I want to ask you guys a quick question here tonight. When you look in your bank statements, what does it show that you're faithful to? Uh, in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 21, it tells us, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is your heart in McDonald's? Is, is your heart in those nice J's we wear every now and then? Is your heart in your clothes? I know one thing. If I call myself a believer and I follow Christ, then my money's going to follow him too. Imagine what the kingdom of God could be if every church member was a tither, a biblical tither, and consistently blessed the Lord's house just because it's been good to us. Imagine how far we could advance and the more people we could reach. In the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 11, we know when we give, God will take care of us. It says, then I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. That's a promise. Tonight, are you going to stand on his promise? Are you going to stand on his word? Or are you going to stand on your fears? In Deuteronomy 8, 18, He's the one who gives us the power to have wealth, to, to make wealth. And I'm telling you right now, with everything I've been through just uh, in the past month, God has proven himself to be faithful over and over and over again. You've got nothing to worry about, guys. If he said he'll do it, he'll do it. Just be faithful to his words and watch him move on your behalf. I want to leave you with this. Nobody wants to be broke, right? God didn't create us to be in lack. Sin brought lack to the world when Adam and Eve got deceived. But 
Christ came into the world to restore what we gave away, which is our right to live in the abundance as sons and daughters. I want to encourage you tonight to be generous. God is generous. Christ is generous. And if our aim is to be like Christ, then we must also give our tithe, give our 10% and offerings. What do you have to lose? There's not too many things that God said you can test me in, but he said you can test me in this. God pretty much said, I dare you to trust me and see if I won't do it. We believe God doesn't lie. So tonight, I'd like the host to come up, please. Whatever you have, be faithful with it. God can't trust you if you're not faithful with it. He's going to give it to the next person who's willing to be faithful. I'm going to go ahead and pray. And after I pray, uh, please bring your offerings tied to the container. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for tonight. Father, if you haven't done, if you don't do one more thing, God, you've done enough. Father, I pray you would bless every single soul who's, who's willing to participate, who's willing to be obedient, who's willing to sacrifice for the kingdom. Lord, I just bless your mighty name tonight. And I pray you would bless them, God. Bless them beyond their imagination, God. Bless them beyond what they thought you could do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Please bring your offering up. Hey everyone, welcome to The Cure Church. My name is Beloved and I serve with The Cure Kids. Here at The Cure, we exist to see the sickness of sin cured by the power of Jesus. Our online and in-person services are Sundays at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Child care is provided from ages 8 weeks to 12 years old and is provided at every service. If you're looking to make this your church home, we have two ways you can be a part of our Cure community. Next and Groups. Next is a six-week course that explains where we came from, what we believe, and how you can start your journey to be a part of a team. Our groups meet all across the city every Friday night at 7 p.m. and are fundamental for growth and community. To sign up for either one, text CONNECT to 913-596-0006. And please, during service, to minimize any distractions, silence your phones. We are so happy that you're here, and we hope you enjoy the rest of service. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen realm, against mighty powers in this dark world. And against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This is The Supernatural. All right. Give the Lord a hand clap. Come on, praise Jesus right now. What a great Sunday. We had an awesome service this morning. How many like that football game? I was talking about the Raider game. We finally won. <laughs> Oh, what a blessing. You know, uh, I, I tell you, one of the blessings, uh, I, we're, I'm in this chat with the pastors, and we, I, I'm listening, and John and Becca, you know, uh, I think in a couple weeks, they're flying to Houston to spy out the land, to get ready to open up the Cure Church Houston. 
but if you didn't see them this morning, they were ministering at the Cure Church Blue Springs. And uh, Pastor Lewis was ministering at the Cure Church Lawrence, which he's normally at the Cure Church Lee Summit. Uh, um, um, Leavenworth, but he's norm you're normally at the Cure Church Lee Summit. Yeah, and he was ministering at Leavenworth. And uh, uh, I, I love to see the guys helping each other, ministering for each other. Not because they're doing it, but I remember when these guys got saved. And to watch them get risen up and become great pastors and great ministers. Uh, I'm just very proud to see that. And I love it on sometimes Sunday nights and other times they come out and they bless the church that they grew in, got saved in. Most of them got married here, discipled and sent out. Uh, and I know they hear from God, man. And tonight we are blessed, amen, all the way from the Cure Church Lee Summit, Pastor Lewis Kelso. Give the Lord a hand clap as he comes. Come on now, somebody give God some radical praise in the house of the Lord. Come on, you got to do better than that. Come on, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Come on. This is how we honor God. We honor God, amen, by giving him praise and the honor and the glory that he deserves, amen. But while we're on our feet, can we honor the said man and the said woman of God in this place, amen. Our apostles, my pastor, Pastor Kelly, Pastor Esther, we love you, cherish you, and we celebrate you, amen. Thank you so much. And just thank you for that moment. You know, it's been a running thing in our church, Pastor Esther. We do WWPED. What would Pastor Esther do? If you don't know, go back to last Sunday, man. We have an awesome woman of God, amen, and Pastor Esther, amen. And I just appreciate you guys. Thank you for this opportunity to minister God's word, amen. Uh, let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, Lord God, and we just open ourselves up to what you desire to do both in us and through us. Father, we thank you for the refreshing that's already happened and happening in this atmosphere. We thank you, Lord God, that you're refreshing our faith refreshing our convictions, refreshing, God, our hunger and our desire for you. And, Lord, we pray as we always do, Lord God, that you would just take this service, do what you want to do with it. Have your way, God, not our will, but your will be done. That none of us that came into the house of the Lord tonight will walk out the same way we came in. We pray that when we walk out of this building tonight, we walk out with purpose we walk out with hunger. We walk out with a sense of desperation and urgency like we've never felt before. We love you, Jesus. And I just pray, Lord God, personally, help me to minister your word tonight, God. Let me minister with grace. Minister, Lord God, with passion. Lord, everything that comes out of my mouth, God, let it come out the way it deserves to be when I'm speaking your word, Father. And we thank you, Father, that of all the places we get to be, we get to be in your house tonight. Some of us could be dead. Some of us could be in hospitals. Some of us could be in situations we can't get ourselves out of. But here we are in your house. Father, better is one day in your house than a thousand anywhere else, God. So, Lord, we just pray, breathe on us, speak to us, and have your way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, somebody give them praise one more time in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and find your seats. Amen. And I, I did have an amazing time this morning at the Cure Church Leavenworth. Amen. And God is doing a great work in that church as well. Amen. And I want to start this message by just posing a question. Have you ever had this feeling that you'd rather someone, anyone other than you, do what you've been asked to do? See, if you have siblings, you know what I'm talking about. Take the trash out. Why can't they do it? They ain't doing nothing. But God, he asks us of, of us so many different things, things that make us uncomfortable, things that go against our nature, things that we're fearful of doing, things that you just don't want to do. And I think about this, and I think about the times that God is asking us, take a stand 
for what you believe in. The world has taken their stand. Will you? He's asking you, will you take a stand for your convictions? Will you say what you believe and not be ashamed of it? Even if it goes against popular opinion, will you stand up? Will you speak up? It can be something as easy as posting something on your social media, but you don't want to do it because you're scared someone might be mad at you. It can be witnessing to someone that you don't want to talk to. It can be giving something you don't want to give. And we'd rather someone, anyone other than us, do those things. Why? Because we'd rather stay in a position of comfort and conformity. We'd rather stay in our safe place. We'd rather follow our flesh instead of our spirit. Come on, somebody. We'd rather anyone do what we've been called to do. And Moses was a man. And I want to minister with just a few moments on Moses. He was a man who was bold enough at times to go and seek out his Hebrew brethren and break up a fight between two of them. He was bold enough to say, I'm going to be a peacemaker. He was bold enough to come back another day and to begin to see an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. And Moses looked around, didn't see nobody, so he killed the Egyptian. So we know that there was a sense of boldness inside of Moses at one time. And it makes me wonder how he could say what I'm about to read. In Exodus chapter 4 verse 13, Moses tells the Lord, Lord, please send anyone else. He's begging God, use someone else, send anyone else. I do not want to do it. He didn't care who God would choose instead of him. He didn't care if he would lose his reward for not doing what God had called him to do. He just didn't want to do it. He begged and he pleaded, God, send anyone else. As I lay this groundwork here, we go all the way back to Exodus chapter 1. Well, the children of Israel were in Egypt after following Joseph and his family when they resided in Goshen. The Bible says that They multiplied. There were many of them. Most scholars believe that they were in Egypt anywhere from 200 to 400 years. But if you read this and you know this text, we understand that Joseph was there, but Joseph died. His family died. The Pharaoh who he found favor with had died. And they begin to see this multitude of Hebrews beginning to grow and grow. And the Pharaoh looked out and he said, man, if they wanted to, they could join together with other nations and overtake us. So we said, what we need to do is we need to enslave them. We need to put them in bondage that we might wear them down. Can I tell you something tonight? That's the reason the enemy wants you in bondage tonight to wear you down. That you're not able to be who God has called you to be. He even went as far as saying, listen, midwives, if a baby is born to an Hebrew woman, kill it. All the way back then, the devil's been using abortion. Murdering of babies to snuff out another generation of men and women of God. Amen. Even as far as back then. And he says, kill them. And the midwives feared God. And they said, listen, we, we try. But when we get there just too fast, it, bloop, this is done. That's how easy it is, right? It's done. And he said, listen, then here's what we're going to do. Go around door to door, find any Hebrew boy and throw them into the river. He wanted to destroy a generation, church. And we know that they were in bondage. They suffered. But who knows that God hears the cry of his people? Come on, who knows that God will hear the cry of his sons and daughters? Amen? The Bible says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, it says that one day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. I want to show you something. The verse that we just read says that Moses was what? Tending the flock. To tend the flock is to care for the flock. As a shepherd, Moses was called to protect them from the dangers around them. The environment, the threat, the wolves. He was called to lead them so they wouldn't get lost and fall into the hands of predators. 
It says that he led them far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. Now Moses had been doing this very thing for many years for his father-in-law, Jethro. And without him knowing it, God had been training him and teaching him how to lead through the wilderness. What he had been doing with the sheep is what God was going to call him to do with the lost sheep of Israel. Those who are in bondage to the hands of the Egyptians. Can I tell you something tonight, church? God won't call you to something he hasn't already prepared you for. Moses didn't know it, but all that time in the wilderness, all that time leading and guiding these sheep was preparing him to lead the sheep out of Egypt. It wasn't something he had no idea how to do. When you don't know it, all the hell you go through, all the things you endure, things you think, why am I going through this? Is God preparing you for what he's about to do in your life? Come on, don't despise when things get hard. Don't get upset when things ain't going your way. Don't be mad at the job God has called you to do. It might be he's preparing you. He's been showing them all these years, this is how you care. This is how you protect my sheep, Moses, even from themselves. He was showing Moses, listen, on long journeys, you need to know how to keep them around, not to even lose a single one. Because the time was coming when he wouldn't just be shepherding sheep, he'd be shepherding people. And here's what's amazing. Moses, the Bible says, led these sheep to Sinai, the mountain of God. The very same place that God would have Moses and the people in Exodus 19 to 20 receive the very Ten Commandments from the Lord. He didn't know it, but he'd already been to the place God was going to take him. You didn't catch it. God has already positioned you, prepared you for what he's about to bring you. You think, man, I've never been here. It can be in dreams. It can be in visions. But God has already made you ready because you stood where God's about to take you. And all God is calling us to do is stand where I'm going to take you. Exodus chapter 3 verse 7 says, Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries and distress because of their harsh slave driver. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. Verse 8, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians. Here's what you need to understand. God is making it crystal clear. I have come down to rescue them. You're not doing anything. You ain't saving nobody, amen? Listen, as shepherds, we understand we don't save nobody. We don't heal nobody. We don't deliver nobody. God does it, but in his grace and mercy, he might use us to be an instrument of his glory and power. He says, listen, you ain't doing nothing, Moses. You ain't got it like that, but I will come down and I will rescue my people. I will get them out of bondage. I will get them out of their distress. I've heard their cry tonight. I've heard what they're going through. I know the pain, the suffering, everything they're dealing with. I will come down. Because the truth is this. If we think it's us, we start meddling around. We start messing stuff up. Can I tell you something? Don't touch God's glory. Don't ever for a minute think, oh, look what I did, amen. Anything you've ever done or accomplished, you may have written a book, you may have preached the most amazing message, your voice may be on the bomb, but let me tell you something, don't touch his glory. Anything you do, you better give honor and glory to the one who allowed you to do it, amen. That revelation you thought he only gave you, God gave it to you, amen. Give him the glory. Give him the honor. Praise his holy name. Why don't we do that right now? Give God some praise right now. You are worthy of it all, God. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy, God. Hallelujah. Come on, can you believe it? The God in his mercy will use a bunch of messed up people like us to do anything that I can lift up my hands who am I that I'm worthy to lift up my hands and give him praise who am I that I can minister this word who are you that you can receive it we are nothing and God knows it but he chooses to use us 
If you've ever given a word of encouragement to somebody, God chose you and used you, amen. If God ever used you to talk someone off the ledge, thank God that you would use someone like me. Come on, there's none righteous, no, not one. And it says, I will come down. I will come down. And he says, and lead them out of Egypt into their own. Oh, you know what I love about God? He will take you from just being someone who goes around place to place. He will take you from being a wanderer to an occupier. Come on, I want my own, Lord. I don't want to go around hanging out in someone else's, amen? I want my own. He says, I'm going to give them their own fertile and special land. It is a land flowing. Come on, you're excited like I am. Because my church knows when I talk about milk and honey flowing down a river, man, I, I get excited. Milk's expensive, man. I got kids that drink milk, man. I would love to just go to the lake and say, all right, man, go get them. Y'all don't know our pain with the milk in our house. Amen. And he says, there's a land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me. And I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go. For I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested. Who am I? Come on, somebody say that with me. Who am I? Come on, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Who am I? You know what it denotes? It denotes a lack of confidence in who you are. Who am I? Who am I? And not only a lack of confidence in who you are, but a lack of confidence in who God made you. Come on, you were fearfully and wonderfully made tonight, church. Come on, you ain't got to be like somebody else. You are who you are, who God made you. See, it stems to what Moses felt about himself. He dealt with these insecurities, and it really had nothing to do with what God thought about him. The truth is this, if God felt the same way about how we feel about ourselves, we'd never do anything. You ever thought about that? If God looked at me the way I look at myself, I'd never do anything for the kingdom. But you know what our Lord does? He looks past every lie that's been spoken about us, amen. He looks past everything that's been spoken over you by someone else. He said, I ain't got to believe that because I created you. I know who you are. You are not who they said you are. You're not a loser, amen. You're not going to prison. You won't be an alcoholic. You won't be divorced. You won't go through all the hell you've been through. And families, come on, I know who you are. I created you. I break every generational curse right now in the name of Jesus because what you've seen is not who you are he sees past the past the mistakes the failures every time we've missed the mark see Moses only saw himself and that's how we are sometimes we see ourselves and all we see is what we see so we're, that means we're too busy looking in the natural not in the supernatural so when Moses got up and looked himself in the mirror he saw a fugitive Come on, anybody got warrants? Don't raise your hand, don't worry about it. <laughs> he saw himself as a wanted man. He saw himself as a murderer. He saw himself as nothing more than a shepherd leading sheep that weren't even his. So this is why he said, who am I? Who am I that I could go before somebody like Pharaoh? Who am I that I can lead anyone? You may even ask yourself, you may ask the Lord the same question at times, who am I? Who am I? But the truth is, it doesn't matter who you are. Come on, it doesn't matter who you think you are. All that matters is who God says I am, amen? So my opinion, your opinion, no opinion matters except the opinion of God. It doesn't matter. When I start asking who am I, I wish you start asking who is God? When I feel like in the, I need to know who I am, I just need to say, God, who are you in my life? It doesn't matter who I am. It matters who you are. Who, who is God in my life? Who is God in my marriage? Who is God in my children? And here's how God responds when he says, who am I? Over and over again, who am I to do this? Who am I to do that? Here's how God responds to him. He says in verse 12, I will be with you. I will be with you. 
Isn't that everything that matters? Isn't that all that matters? Because if God is for me, who could be against me? He says, I will be with you. Amen. Listen, when I know God is with me, it goes above and beyond my own abilities. It makes me understand where I'm limited, God ain't. So I don't have to go in my own resources that run out because I'm a man, I'm human. I go to the resource that never runs out. Come on, my king never gets tired, never gets wore out, amen. Come on, I'm talking about the dunamis power of God that fills us, that explosive Holy Spirit inside of us. When we lack, he does it. And when we have that confidence, church, that God is with us, guess what? We can do anything. Why? Because the Bible says so. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things, not some things, not a few things, all things. Because I understand that nothing is being done under my own power, but the power of God. And he says, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Look at me. He is showing confidence in what Moses could do through him. Catch that. He said, listen, you will lead them out, and guess what? Where you're standing, you'll be right back here worshiping me. He's giving them confidence. This is confidence from God. But Moses protested. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, guess what? They're going to ask me questions. What's his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Somebody needs to get excited right now. I am who I am. I am who I am. Why is that so important, church? He goes, say to the people, I am essential. Why is that important? Because I am means I didn't start and I won't finish. I always have been and I always will be. I am is saying, listen, I, that is my eternal name. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if they don't know who I am by that, then they don't know me at all. There's power in I am. There's power in knowing that God always has been and he always will be. God tells Moses, just go. He tells him, gather the leaders. He begins to prophesy about how they will go out of Egypt. And they will go out of Egypt. And I'm not going to read it all for the sake of time, but they go out of Egypt with the wealth of the Egyptians. He says, all you got to do is go ask them, hey, I want that. I want that. And you will literally walk out of Egypt, amen. You may have been bondage for years, 200, 400 years. But guess what? When you step out, you're stepping out in style. Come on, you step out, you're stepping out with the wealth of all the Egyptians, amen. You will strip everything they have and you will put it on yourself and walk out into your freedom. Come on, that's how I want deliverance to look, amen. I, come on, that's how I want breakthrough to look. We're not crawling out of deliverance. We're stomping out of deliverance, wearing everything the enemy tried to take from us. Come on, somebody hear me tonight. He's laying out a vision before Moses. And Moses knew firsthand what his brethren were going through. He was there with them at one point. And he gets to be the one to lead them into their deliverance of freedom of bondage. Amen. Can I tell you something? There's a reason that God wants to send you back to your friends and family. Come on, it can't be premature lest they get you back into the old ways of living and the old world and the old lifestyle. But man, Moses... He'd been out of Egypt for a long time. And he, listen, he could have picked anybody. Why Moses? Moses, you've been there. You've seen the cry. You've seen the desperation. You've seen the hurt. You've seen the pain. Your heart should be for them for you saw it firsthand. And God calls us like that. There's people we know, our friends and family. I remember years ago when, when Pastor Kelly wrote Punker to Passion, all of his punker friends started getting saved. And it made me think about that moment that how God will take us out of a situation out of where we were, out of that lifestyle, but then return us back with the glory of God. That souls might be changed, lives may be seen and transformed, amen. Exodus 4.1 says, but Moses protested again. I mean, God is doing his thing. And it's almost at this point where God's trying to sell him on it. But he, he protests again. He says, what if? Somebody say, what if? What if they won't believe me? What if they won't listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? When God has called us to something, we cannot get caught up in the unknowns. We can't get caught up in the what ifs. 
The what is will fill, keep you from fulfilling your destiny. You'll never do what God wants you to do if you always have a what if in your spirit. When me and my wife answered the call of God to go and plant a church, we had a lot of what ifs. We had hands laid on us and, all right, let's do it. There's a lot of what ifs. Because we weren't taking the congregation with us. Come on, we didn't, we didn't do a church, but we did a church plant. And we had me and my wife and our three kids. So leading up to it, I began to have these what ifs. What if people don't come? What if people don't get saved? What if this doesn't happen? What if that don't happen? What if I'm not good enough? What if people don't like me? What if, what if, what if? Over and over again. I had a lot of what ifs just like Moses did. After God tells him, I'm going to do this. I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you to deliver my people out of their bondage. After God told him, you and the people will worship me right here in this exact same spot that you're standing in right now. Moses says, but what if? What if they don't believe? What if they don't listen? What if they say this or they say that? And God, in all of his glory, responds to Moses' question with a question of his. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? This is powerful if you catch it. Because God will take you from what if to what is. He will take you from the what if to the what is. What, what am I saying? I'm saying he will take you past the hypotheticals and into a reality. Past what you think may or may not happen into what I know is about to happen. And then Moses replied, listen, it's just, a, it's just a staff, it's just a shepherd's staff. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab his tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Can I tell you something tonight? It wasn't a special staff. Matter of fact, it's the same staff he'd been carrying around all these years, leading the sheep into the wilderness. But can I tell you something? God can take the regular, ordinary things in your hands and cause it to be used for his glory. Where you think, come on, it could even be your own self. Where you think this is not significant. It really doesn't matter. No one else cares. God says, but I will take it. And if you put it in my hand, I will use it for my glory. Come on, all through the Bible, you see God take insignificant things. Look what he did with two fish and five loaves. Miracles happen. But we have to be willing to release the things we have into his hands, even if it doesn't seem like much. Some of you say, I don't want to get involved because I, I don't know how to do it. I, I don't have much to offer, but offer it. Yeah. Some of you say, I don't know if I can go because I don't have this or I have that. Just give it. And when we place it into the hands of God, something powerful can happen. God said, you're going to use this. The very thing in your hand, you're going to use it to show my power. He showed him that. He showed him more miracles. He told him, put your hand in your cloak. He did it. Now take it out. It was leprous. Put it back. Take it out. Healed. He said, come on, you're going to do these things, and, and they're, going to, they're going to see my power. He said, if that don't work, take some water out of the Nile River. Bring it to the ground. Drop it, and it will turn into blood. And Moses was still resistant. He continued to give reasons and excuses and worries as to why he couldn't do it. First, it was this. I don't believe in myself. Who am I? Then it was, what if? Now Moses said, oh, Lord, I believe that Moses talked just fine until he said these words. Oh, Lord, I'm not very, very good with my words. I don't believe he had no issue until that moment. Man, what can I think of next? I don't want to do this. Oh, I don't speak good. He begins to say this. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you were spoken to me, I get t -t -t tongue tied and my words get tangled. But it's curious because if you read your Bible, you see in Acts chapter 7, verse 22, where Stephen's about to get stoned and he begins to speak to those who are about to stone him. He's preaching God's word and he says, 
Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both speech and action. Somebody's lying. Stephen or Moses, I don't know. Somebody ain't telling the truth. I I don't know how God didn't put them on blast, but whatever. He got away with that one, amen? But nevertheless, the Lord asked Moses, okay, you don't think you talk well? Who makes the mouth? Who you talking to? Who makes the mouth? Who makes one speak and not speak, hear and not hear, see and not see, ain't it I? He didn't say ain't, but. He said, listen, you encountered me at a burning bush. And now you don't believe that I could use your mouth to speak what I won't spoken? Come on, man. Can we relate to Moses right now? Come on, Lord, help us. He says in verse 12, now go. I will be with you as you speak it. I will instruct you in what to say. Why is that important? What God says is, why is it important? Because God will not call you to something he's not equipped you to do. Come on, are you hearing that? He won't call you to something he hasn't already prepared you and equipped you to do. Before the building, God provides a blueprint. Before the destination, guess what? He provides the directions. It may be turn by turn. I don't know where I'm going, but God lead me and guide me. But Moses, verse 13, again pleaded, Lord, please. Come on, you want to say it with me? They have no send anyone else. Send anyone else. Lord, please send anyone else. Lord, please, I, anyone else. All those excuses beforehand were masked to the real issue. The truth is just this. Moses just didn't want to go. He didn't want to go. It was deeper than the self-esteem. It was deeper than the insecurity. It was deeper than the questions. It was deeper than all that. The truth is, he didn't want to go. He's literally begging God, saying, anyone else but me. Moses wanted God to call someone else, to send his message by the hand of someone else. He didn't want to go. He wanted to live like he wanted to live, do what he wanted to do, live the way he wanted to live, he was rejecting the call of God that was on his life. Can I tell you something? We're not always going to want to go where God's telling us to go or do what God is calling us to do. But God wouldn't call us if he didn't know we could actually answer and respond and fulfill that very thing. And for God to call us to anything, hear me. What a privilege. What an honor that you would call me for anything. What an honor I can clean your house. What an honor I can sweep the floor. What an honor I could host and be an usher. What an honor I could do anything. But for anything you've called me to, I know you've prepared me and you've given me every tool I need to do it to the best of my ability. Because, listen, if we do something for God, we do it with excellence. We don't do stuff half-hearted, half-effort, nothing. If we're doing it for the king, you you do something for people half-hearted, that's between you and whatever. But if we're doing it for God, we have to do it with a spirit of excellence, amen? We have to give our all because we have to understand who we're doing it unto. The call to be a messenger, the call to be a deliverer on behalf of the Lord is something every one of us is called to do. It's not for the pastors. It's not for the title people. It's for all people. His word calls us to it. Amen? So we can't sit there and ask him, Lord, send anyone else. Let someone else do it. Let let brother so-and-so do it. Let sister so-and-so do it. I don't want to do it. He's called you to it. Because if not us, then who? If not now, then when? We've been trusted with the treasure of God's word. Amen? Amen? Now, if we've been saved long enough, we know that Moses did end up being a great leader. He led the people out of Egypt, out of bond. He crossed with God's people on dry ground across the Red Sea. But there's a couple asterisks next to Moses' name. Because Moses had to have someone come with him to speak when he could have done it himself. He had to have someone else with him to do what God called him to do. Can I tell you something tonight? 
as I bring this down. I don't want to live my life being a resistant Moses. I don't want to live my life being a resistant Moses. Guess what? I'd rather be a willing Isaiah. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, it was in the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. Guess what Moses saw? Moses saw the Lord through the fiery brush. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim. Are you catching this? Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw the temple. He saw the throne. He saw seraphim. Each has six wings. Two wings that cover their faces. Two they cover their feet. Two they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's army. Not only did he see, he heard the worship of heaven. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations. And the entire building was filled with smoke. Somebody stand to your feet. Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet, I have seen the king and the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord. Come on, I don't want to be a resistant Moses. I want to be a willing Isaiah. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, mm, 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 me, I'll go, send me, I'll go, I'll do it, I'll go. If no one else will, I'll go, I'll do it. If no one else wants you, I'll go. Come on, he wasn't like Moses. I can't do it. I don't talk right. What if this happens? He said, I don't care of the consequence. I don't care what I might go through. If you would use someone with filthy lips like me to do anything, I will do it. Come on, where? Where's the men and women who say, here I am, Lord. I don't have a lot to offer. I don't got it all together. I'm a messed up man. I'm a messed up woman. But if you would use someone like me, I'll do it. I'll preach your word. I'll go to nations. I'll be a missionary. I'll do whatever needs to be done because I understand that I don't deserve it. I am not worthy. But Lord, if you would use somebody like me, if you could, if no one else is lifting up their hand, if no one else is volunteering for the call of God, I will. You know me more than anyone else, Lord. You know my ins and my outs. You know my struggles. You know where I fall short. You know those areas where I keep crying out, where I'm weak, give me strength. You heard how many times I pray, God, give power to the powerless because that's me. You've heard me cry out again and again, but in that, if you would choose to use someone like me, it would be my honor, God. It would be my honor to stand before your people, to be a prophet to the nations. It'd be my honor to be your mouthpiece. I know it's not me. I know it's not me. Lord, I just want to be a vessel. I just want to be an instrument for your glory. I don't want the credit. I give it all to you. God is looking for people that will stop believing the lie. That lie that says you can't. Why would God use someone like you? Why wouldn't he? I'm looking for people to stop believing that lie that I can't do it. Stop listening to the lie. What if it don't work? 
What if that don't happen? God is looking for people to say, man, I'm a broken man. I'm broken. I'm messed up. But Lord, if you could use me, I pray use me. Lord, I pray for Brother Kevin right now, God. And I pray, Lord God, that as he comes before you raw and barren, Lord God, that you would give him fruit once again, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you would use him, Lord Father. For Lord, no one else in this place ran to the altar. But he said, here I am. If no one else will do it, I'll do it. If no one else will go, I'll go. If no one else will say it, I will. God, I pray that because of that, you give him a boldness that he's never had before, God. I pray a boldness of a lion, God. Kevin, the time of being a lamb is over. You are called to be a lion. You are called to roar. You are called to be what God has called you to be. He's not looking for perfect. He's looking for purchased. He's looking for the ones who will surrender themselves, washed by the blood, and walk in the fullness of the power and the glory of God. Jesus, use him right now. Come on, is there anyone else? Is there anyone else to say, here I am, God. Here I am, Lord, use me. You may not have been the first, but you won't be the last. Get to this altar right now. Position yourself for God to use your life. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus. Come on, come. Come. Come on, man of God. Paul told his disciple Timothy, when he gave him instruction to the church, he said, men should lift up holy hands. Come on, men, lift up your holy hands before the Lord. Holy hands. Come on, let the Lord begin to just fill you, fill you with desperation for the call. Come on, you're in the right church. You're in the right place because this is a church that believes that God could use your life. Pastors all over this place, go around begin to lay hands on people right now. Every pastor in this place, please go lay hands on some people. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, we praise you, Lord Father. I pray use this couple, God, for more, Lord God. Everything they've heard or seen or experienced at this point is nothing compared to what you desire to do, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will show them fully and completely, God, what you desire to do in their life. They not, may not have been there in the physical, but in the spiritual, you're going to give them visions and dreams of places and people, God. And you're going to take them, and when they get there, it's going to be like, I've already been here. I've already been here. I already know the people that I'm called to reach. I know what I'm called to do. Father in heaven, prepare them right now, Lord God. For, Lord, when they get there, they will be ready ready. Bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Oh, more, 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 God. Come here. More, God, more, God, more, God. In the name of Jesus, more, Lord, more, Lord. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Even the very laying on hands cause them to posture themselves to what you want to do in them and through them. Father, I pray, make them ready, Lord God. Make them ready as vessels and instruments of your glory, Father. Lord in heaven, I pray, send them, God. They'll go. Send them. They'll go. If no one else do it, they will, Father. God in heaven, I pray. Here, I feel this. Hold, hold each other's hands. Lord, I pray that you would make this a dynamic team, Lord God, of ministers of the gospel. Father, I pray for more open doors than they've ever experienced before, God. Father, thank you, Lord God, for elders who rule well, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would have your way, Lord God. Father, raising up godly children wasn't just the only thing they were called to do, Lord God. You've called them for more, God. So, Father, we pray that in this next season, God, that you will show them the very thing you want them to do, Lord. Bless them now. Breathe upon them in Jesus' name. this place. He's all over this place. Oh, it's really not that much I can do, Jesus. What I have seems so small, but I want to give it all to you.
Thank you, Lord God, that you cause her to be a vessel that is open to receive the outpouring of your spirit, God. Father, her hands are like a funnel, receiving everything, Lord God, that you have for them. Nothing shall be missed. Nothing shall be missed. There would be nothing that runs to the left or to the right. It will fall directly in its intended target. Father, nothing shall be wasted when you pour it out upon the mother of this house. So, Father, we pray, bless her, God. Anoint her. Use her, Lord God. Worship God. Songs, ministry, nations, people, more and more and more, God. In the name of Jesus, fill her up, God. Fill her up. Nothing shall be wasted. But Lord, if you choose to, you will cause her to overflow with your goodness. Give me some women of God that surround her who want what God is pouring into her to come over your life. Come on, every pastor's wife, get around her. Get around her. Get around her. Every pastor's wife, get around her. Get around her. Yes, Chris O'Connor. And then around them, every other woman, get around them. Come on, God is doing something right now, spectacular. Holy Ghost. Because what God pours into her is what's needed for the women of God in this house. Father, we thank you. Even for the women that are holding her hands up, God. For when her hands get weary, Lord God, she has those around her, God, who will help bear her burdens. Mm. Father, we pray more and more. Why? Because, Lord, she has those around her, Lord God, that will help her hold up what you're desiring to do in her and through her. Lord, raise up an army of radical, anointed, set-apart, consecrated women of God who will follow the example of Pastor Esther, God. Worship and songs and nations and people worship and songs nations and people i keep hearing that more and more more and more come on more and more more and more more and more more and more come on somebody more and more god in the name of jesus come on somebody give god praise right now somebody give the lord praise right now hallelujah Pastor Kelly, as I was standing here on these steps, I literally had this vision, and this word come to me. You are a launching pad. I believe that's something that's been spoken or heard before in this place. You are a launching pad. But I believe it's going to be more than just launching pad for new works and new churches. It's going to be a launching pad of opportunity for men and women who didn't feel significant enough to do anything for God. God picked the right man and right woman to lead this network because you didn't come into the church out of seminary. You came to the church after a three-day meth binge. You know what it is to feel overlooked. You know what it is to feel like I have nothing, I have nobody, I have nothing to offer, but God chose you. God don't make mistakes. He knew the kind of people that would get saved, not only in this church, but in this network. And the truth is going to be this. If God can raise up a man of God like this out of that that God can take someone out of that place into this place then it's proof that God can do it in anybody lift up your hands man of God Father in the name of Jesus stretch your hands toward the apostle of this house Father I thank you for the launching pad you've given to Kansas City Kansas God because of him souls are being saved in Lee Summit Leavenworth Lawrence 
Blue Springs, Chicago, St. Louis, Nashville, Kentucky, soon to be Houston. God in heaven, thank you for a man who said yes to the call of God. Thank you for someone who says, if no one else will go far, I will. When everyone else wanted to stay in the comfort and conformity of California, you said, I'll go. I'll go. I'll go to Chicago. If not, I'll go to Kansas City. I'll go. And because you said yes to the call of God, others have said yes to the call of God based on your example, man of God. Thank you, Lord, for everything we see around us was done through the Holy Spirit and the power of God. But God uses people. Thank you for allowing God to use you in your family, in your marriage, and to share your life. Thank you, man of God. Come on, somebody give God praise right now. Come on, lift up your hands all over this place. Father, we pray that you would write the very word spoken on the tablets of our heart. We may lose paper. We may lose our notepad, but we'll never lose what you inscribe in our hearts. I'll go. I'll go. I'll do it. I'll do it. No one else? Okay, I'll do it. Matter of fact, I'm not even waiting on someone else to decline. I just accept. I don't have to be a replacement. I could be the first choice. Lord, use me. Use me. If you want to use someone like me, please use me. I'm not asking you, please send someone else. I'm saying, Lord, please pick me. Please use me that I might be an instrument of your glory. We thank you, Lord, for your word and for your spirit, God. Your presence changes lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, somebody give God praise right now. Can we get another round of applause for Pastor Lewis? I've known Pastor Lewis my entire life, and I just want to say thank you for all the trials that you've been through, sticking it out, being faithful, just and letting God use you even tonight. God will not give us something he hasn't equipped us for. Those trials that you're going through, all that hardship in your life, make sure you're letting God build you and rebuild you through that process. Don't, don't shy away. Don't, don't like get even farther away from the house of God. Get closer to God through your trials. I only have two announcements and then we will dismiss. Midweek, we have our very own Pastor Jeremiah Hicks. And then in the coffee bar, we do have the merch. Guys, I encourage you to get the merch, not just because it'll make you look cooler, but also because it is a statement. I've had people come up to me wearing uh, Cure Church merch and they're like, hey, what does that mean? And in that way, I'm able to, to share the love of God with them. So again, just go get it. It's a statement. And we will see you guys here midweek here at the Cure Church.